The objective today is to be able to explain the difference between a port and a socket. So the prereq before watching this video is you should have either taken my web design or AP CSP class. You should have quite a bit of basic technology knowledge. And then if, of course, you're not in any of my classes, you can watch those playlists of web design and AP um, on the YouTube channel itself. So in terms of a table of contents for this video, first I'll address what a port is in a socket, and for most of you this will be a bit of a review. And then I'm going to talk about the two types of ports you'll commonly hear in the tech world. That way you can ground yourself in the different types. Of course I'll go over the, the relation these have to servers and then just networking in general. And then I'll finish the video by talking about their purpose and giving you a few examples of when and why they're used. So first think right share of the day, what is a port number? It says here that a port number is used as part of a network connection. Not all network connections use port numbers. For instance, ICMP, which is used by Traceroute, so you may have seen TraceCert, this is a Microsoft Windows thing, um, and then the Microsoft Windows ping command, like these two, they do not use port numbers. Uh, the most common protocols that do are UDP and TCP, and many protocols including HTTP and HTTPS and SMTP, which is used for email, um, they use TCP. So almost any time TCP is being used, uh, we're talking about ports, okay? And it's not a port for international trade like in the picture here. We're talking about a port for communication. If a port is closed, then communication is going to be um, closed. Or maybe I should say, if you have a computer and all the ports are closed, then the computer cannot communicate to another computer. And think of that in terms of security implications. If you want to shut down your computer like you're afraid of something going on, you could just turn off all the ports. But obviously that is no long-term solution. So let me take you over to this website I found where they will list out the most common ports used. So the website's called Meridian Outpost, and I like the way they present this. And the title here is TCP IP well-known port numbers 0 to 1023. And if I remember correctly, I think there's like 65,000 ports. Okay, I just had to double check that. It says 65,535. So going back over here to the most common used ports, the first one I noticed that I know a bit about is port 7, so that's for when you want to echo a computer, see if it's reachable, so that is to say, see if an IP address is in existence. Another one we'll talk quite a bit about in this class is port 22, which is an SSH port. And you see here it accepts both TCP and UDP uh, protocols. These are the transport layer protocols. Uh, UDP stands for user datagram, and then TCP stands for transmission transmission control protocol. I always forget what the C stands for in this one. So this port will accept those two types of protocols. Same with the echo port, port number seven. But some of these you can see here is strictly for TCP only. Another concept we talked quite a bit about in my AP CSP class was DNS. That's the domain name system. And so that's functioning on port 53. A lot of people know of port 80, but I'm going to say the internet, uh, okay, mostly Google. They're trying to get away from using HTTP. We're trying to go to HTTPS. So from what I understand, Google will not show websites that use this port in their search results anymore. Doesn't mean it'll completely go away, but it just means if you search for something, typically Google's not going to route you to a HTTP port. Another interesting one here is IRC. That stands for Internet Relay Chat. So let me give you one um, hardcore example of what an IRC is like. This is my favorite one. I guess this is the only one I use nowadays, and I do use it rarely. So notice up here it does not say HTTPS or HTTP. This is using that port. What port number is it? Uh, port 194. So going back here, I have connected to that server by going through port uh, 194. And 
what this does, or at least what you'll find often on here, is people talking about this guy Leo's radio shows. And he has a lot of radio shows, and he refers to this a lot. So I, I'll be honest, I don't type in very much stuff here. And as we can see right now, um, we're on Twit Live, so we should be able to see uh, people conversating if there were people conversating. But there's not right now. Uh, I'm sure once one of these shows start, though, you can see some discussion on there. So Twit is a network of podcasts that I really enjoy and I've learned so much from. And I really suggest this to anybody who likes playing video games. Why not, when you're playing games, especially if you don't need to actually hear what's going on, why don't you continue to learn? Maybe listen to an informational podcast. So even if you're not always 100% listening, you're still setting yourself up for opportunities to continue to learn, even when having fun. And I do think learning is fun, obviously, being a teacher, but it gets really fun when you're just playing video games and listening to podcasts. So looking here, um, I used to listen to or watch some know-how back when I first started getting into tech, but this one, Security Now, is the one I'm most obsessed with. I've listened to every minute of every single podcast, and some of them I've listened to a few times. Uh, he goes in great depth, Mr. Gibson here, he goes in great depth about the technical details of security. And what I appreciate a lot about him as well is his uh, love for sci-fi and is also his love for assembly code. Like, assembly is where I'm happiest, not the high-level programming languages. So he refers to that quite a bit in the podcast. Another good one is uh, The Tech Guy, and this really helps me out in terms of being able to explain simple ideas, or I should say complex ideas, very simply. So if you're just getting into tech, this is a really good place to start. If you're interested in the money side of tech, or at least the business side of tech, this week in enterprise is good. Uh, Father Robert Balasar is one of my favorite people to listen to. This Week in Google is a good one I like. This is a really cerebral one, so if you want to start thinking deeply, this is a good place to start. Uh, Leo, Jeff, and Stacy are all very interesting to listen in on. And I just don't know much about the rest of them, so that's why they created the IRC, is so when these guys are on their radio shows, they can look at the IRC and talk about uh, what people are commenting on there. Okay, so back to the ports. I just want to talk about one more and then slide through this so you can see how many there are. Um, the last port we should probably memorize is port 443. This is the HTTPS port. So that means what's coming and going from here is encrypted. And that's a very, very good thing. Sometimes you don't know if a app has security on it or if it encrypts the data going back and forth. So let's say you're at a Starbucks coffee and you're connecting to their public Wi-Fi. Well, some of your apps may not encrypt the data, so somebody could just be sitting in that coffee shop seeing what you're saying or seeing the pictures that are going back and forth between you and somebody. But if you're on a website and it says HTTPS, then you know that's being encrypted. Let's take the uh, Facebook example. Maybe your Facebook app does not have security. I don't know if it does or not. It's challenging to find out uh, which apps have security and which do not. So let's say it's not secure. If you go to your phone and go open up maybe a Chrome browser on your phone and go to Facebook using the HTTPS protocol, then you know for sure that you're safe. So those are the big port numbers I wanted to go over. And as you can see here, I'm just scrolling. There's quite a few that are popular. Like the title says, these are well-known port numbers. So back to the presentation. Make sure you've answered this. What is a port number? I want to very explicitly explain the difference between a port and a socket. So a port can be described as an internal address within a host that identifies a program or a process. Now a socket can be described as a programming interface allowing a program to communicate with other programs or processes on the internet or even locally. It says, in order to get a service, you need a service number. This service number is called a port. Simple as that. So, for example, the HTTP as a service is running on port 80, and HTTPS is 443. They are terms from two different domains. Port is a concept from TCP IP networking.
Now a socket is an API, that's a programming thing. A socket is made in the code by taking a port number and a host name and combining them into a data structure. You can use this data structure to send or receive data. All right, just so we don't get confused here, a port can also refer to a physical connection point for peripheral devices such as a serial parallel and USB ports. The term port also refers to a certain Ethernet connection such as those on a hub, switch, or router. But don't mix these up with uh, what we're talking about today. And if we were preparing for the a certification test, uh, we would want to make sure you've memorized what these types of ports are called. So why do we need to talk about ports and sockets if we have IP addresses? Basically, so a server could connect three IP addresses to three different sockets on the same server. So in order to provide those three separate people the services they are looking for, such as online gaming or social media updates or whatever, that would be a reason for us to understand sockets. So you've known about IP addresses for a while, but now you know that there's more information, more details about a particular location of a computer than just the IP address. So now that we've combined ports and sockets together, let's talk about uh, the difference between the two. It says here that sockets are protocol specific, so the implementation of uniqueness that both TCP IP and UDP IP uses is different. So my example is IPX TCP IP connections are bidirectional pathways. These are connecting one address and port combination with another address and port combination. Therefore, whenever you open a connection from your local machine to a port on a remote server, say google.com, you are also associating a new port number on your machine with the connection, thus allowing the server to send things back to you. So an example of this would be 127.0.0.1 on port 65234. So this is a great visual. Here's the IP address, here's the port, and together they make the socket. So one thing that can be helpful when I'm trying to understand this stuff is to use something called Netstat to look at your machine's connections. So the way you would do that is you just open up a command line, type in Netstat. So let's try that real quick. I'm going to go here and type in CMD and hit enter. And I've already logged on. Now I can type Netstat and push enter and get a lot of information. So if you want to take a moment to do that on your own computer, that'd be great. And this is for Windows, right? If you have a Linux machine running, you can still open up the terminal and do the exact same command. Okay, so if you want to learn more, I would suggest the book Computer Networking, A Top-Down Approach. There is an analogy on, in there about a house that wants to communicate with another house. And I like to compare the concept of an IP address, port, and socket to a hotel. So that's a great comparison the book makes, but let me use my hotel example here. So once you have a message that arrives, it passes through the receiver's uh, door. So you arrive at a hotel. So think of that as the port number. The door number <laughs> is the port. So together they make the socket. And that is, or that will, give you entryway into a particular process, that is to say the room itself. And then the socket is the combination of that information. Both hosts are directly connected to each other, even though there are numerous routers and or switches between them. So thus a socket is not a connection itself, it's the endpoint of the connection. You may have gotten to that hotel by going through the north side of the building, through a street on that side or maybe the south side like the way you got there may be different for every person but once you get there you can use that address and the room number to create this uh, connection um, thus the word endpoint so if you could do me a favor right here and tell me what's the difference between an endpoint and a connection that'd be great okay we're almost done here so stay strong uh, ports provide means of internal addressing to a machine so let's ground ourselves here the primary purpose is to allow multiple processes to send and receive data over the network without interfering with other processes. So really go with that hotel analogy. Inside each room is a process, is something going on. Maybe think of your computer when you um, are chatting on that internet relay chat and then you're jumping to another tab that's open and browsing maybe reddit and then you jump back to maybe you're playing a game an online game fortnite or something like you could have all these processes going on on your machine 
because they're all using different port numbers. So your turn, what is the purpose of a port? Now let's bring it back to sockets. Imagine you had a peer-to-peer -peer chat program, and in its simplest form, two sockets will be created by the chat program, that is, one to send outbound messages, and then one to receive the incoming messages. The moment you press enter on your chat window, your message is written to that socket, which is connected or bound to a network connection your operating system manages. When your chat partner sends you a message back, your chat program reads the data from that socket and displays it to you. So this is a great way to look at how this is actually happening. It says a client socket tries to connect with a server socket. A server socket accepts client socket requests. Down here, a typical TCP-based server socket program will first create the socket, tell the socket to listen for connections on a port, when a connection arrives, it accepts it on a new socket. Then you can send and receive some data on that socket, and then it's closed. Now over here, it says a TCP-based client program might look like this. Uh, first, a socket is created, connected to an endpoint, such as google.com on port 80, and then you send and receive data back and forth like that, and then, of course, close it when you uh, leave google.com. So we've talked about ports and sockets a lot here. If you're curious about what port numbers are assigned, there's a great video from Professor Miser here that you can watch or just search uh, common TCP ports next to his name. He has a nice little list here of ports you should know, and he is creating videos to help prepare you for the Security Plus certification. So if you're watching this video with that purpose, you want to pass that test, he would be a great second resource to go to. Okay, one more thing before I get really technical. Here is a nice visual to try to see what's going on. You have an IP address 1, IP address 2, and here are the ports. And so you can have uh, two different ports talking to each other, but that has to be established. And then when these two are combined, right here, IP address plus port number, then you have yourself a socket. Here's an interesting extra credit tool for you to use. It's called TCP View, and it's fascinating to see what's going on in terms of transfer control protocols on your own machine. Now, one of my favorite authors, Mark Racinovich, wrote a review about this tool, TCP View. And if you haven't heard of him, I highly suggest you read his fiction books because there's a lot to be learned from them, actually. So if you want to read the review, you can go here. Now let's get really technical before we end this video. In my classroom, there's this giant data stream poster, and I use that to try to exemplify the amount of ones and zeros that a computer can receive for something very simple like just straight up text. So think about all those ones and zeros flying around, and then think about these connections aren't just for networks. So the ones and zeros don't just go from one computer to the other. There are ones and zeros going from one part of your computer to another part of your computer. When you open a file, the operating system creates a stream to that file. Similarly, there are some default streams created by the operating system, and these streams are connected to your terminal instead of the uh, files. So when you write something in the terminal, it goes to a standard in stream and when you write the ls command say in the terminal what the operating system does is it writes the output to a standard out stream that way you can see what's going on this standard out stream is connected to your monitor so you can um, see it right there if we're talking about a server a lot of people have a hard time understanding that a server is just a computer typically without a monitor, and just because the monitor is not there doesn't mean that there's not an output. Uh, in that sense, the monitor could be hundreds of miles away, depending on whoever is connecting to the server, or it really could just be uh, right there in the data center itself, especially if it's your job to, to work in the data center. So that's something that just really blew my mind when I was first learning about uh, ports and, and sockets, just the idea that these are being used so that we can connect uh, these streams. Kind of makes me think of Ghostbusters when they say don't cross the streams. You don't want to cross the standard in and standard out stream uh, because then your data will get all jumbled. So let's review what I just tried to describe. When you open a file, the operating system creates an entry to represent that file and stores the information about that open file. If there are 100 files opened in your operating system, then there will be 100 entries somewhere in the kernel. 
These entries are represented by integers like 0, 1, 2, etc. And this entry number is the file descriptor. So it is just an integer number that uniquely represents an open file in an operating system. If your process opens 10 files, then your process table will have 10 entries for file descriptors. So all I'm going to do here is describe some additional information that you might find while you're researching your computer's connections. So now think about this. When you open a, set, a network socket, it is also represented by an integer, and it is called a socket descriptor. So you have file descriptors and socket descriptors. They are uh, similar and different. Your thing right here, here is what is the difference between a socket descriptor and a file descriptor? To do that, you would obviously have to go back here and try to really digest what I was saying. And I think this think right here is going to be a particularly challenging one because of this whole idea. Um, I found a really fun graphic to show everyone. It says here that like all of this is what I think. And then this is what I could put into words. Now this right here is what I'm brave enough to tell other people. <laughs> you know what I mean when I say I can put it into words, but those words I don't always share with other people. So the amount of what I can share is even smaller. And then down here, what people actually understand. So I'm going to just keep trying my best to dish out these security concepts to you. Uh, it is your job to definitely question me and to go on your own uh, for some independent research as well. And if you want to see this information, what you'll do is download something called OS Query using your Linux or Unix command line. And what you'll notice is the file descriptors are done per process. So once you've downloaded this, execute OS Query I and then echo all the open processes going on, or the processes of the open files, I mean. And inside your bash shell, you'll see something like this. Lucky for us, computer programs will do a lot of the analysis, but it's still um, good for you to see and good for you to know where uh, this information is at. So a quick visual to kind of see what I was trying to t talk about, like when you type on your keyboard, there's a standard input and it goes to maybe a particular process that you're working on. And then that particular process sends your data in another standard input stream to a, the particular file that you're working on. And while it's doing that, it will send the same data to the terminal so you can see what you're trying to save to that file. And again, this is just a great visual to um, understand a little bit more than what I actually need you to understand. And that is the concept of how network connections work and how internal connections work. If we ground ourselves here for just a second, there are no computers without inputs and outputs. So these sockets just provide us an ability to direct those inputs and outputs better. Later on, we'll talk about Unix operating systems, and we'll talk about them often in this class. Uh, these include Linux, FreeBSD, and Mac operating system, and the security experts distribution of choice seems to be Kali or Kali. I think it's Kali. I don't know how to pronounce that. But any uh, Unix-like system should help you see the things we talk about in class. And if you're on message boards or Reddit, somewhere trying to learn more about cybersecurity and you see something like this star and next, that just means it's a Unix-like system. So my last check for understanding here in this lesson, I gave you three tools, that is TCP view, NetStat, and OS Query, uh, to use to view certain information, such as an IP address, a port number, and thus a socket. Your think right here is, what are you looking at when you see the following information? So I have a bunch of numbers here. Tell me what these numbers are. Here's a little word bank if you need some words to help you explain. And sometimes I'll try to include these little warnings of the week. This particular warning of the week came from a student's Flash Talk Friday work. So what they had figured out is this guy named Eric Lundgren had been ripping off Microsoft. He manufactured 28,000 counterfeit disks with the company's operating system on them. And I brought this up since we were talking about an operating system today. Uh, he spent 15 months in prison for that and took a $50,000 fine. And he says it was not for profit profit that he did this. He just wanted to make it easier to extend the usefulness of secondhand computers. So what he got when he got released from the case, he became a partner with Microsoft and made $420,000. So that's a pretty good payout. I don't know. Is it worth spending 15 months in prison uh, to get, what, $370,000 in the end?
And I wanted to point this out that the student who um, did this research says that this uh, situation is good because he may have done something bad at first, but he then turned it good and made a lot of money, not just for himself, but for Microsoft. So this shows that even though we do bad things in our life, we could always fix them and succeed, which is a very positive message to uh, take away from such an event. So for anyone interested in an extension activity here, I think this one's pretty uh, challenging. Uh, if you could explain how this fact connects to the concept of sockets. The fact is, a tuple is a collection of values, and the big thing with tuples is the values can be of different types, such as an integer like 1, a string like foo, or a floating point number like 4.6, whereas for lists, they have to be uh, the same type. So there's a little um, similarity and difference between tuples and lists. Can you connect this fact to sockets? And if you're not in my class, let me know in the comments below.